insightful podcasts by informative hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Entertainment, a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Your hosts, Joseph and Michelle Whalen, a husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics, are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. Welcome to Insights into Entertainment. This is episode 35, The Happiest Vegans on Earth. (laughs) I'm your host, Joseph Whalen, and my vibrant and intelligent co-host, Michelle Whalen. Well, good morning, or hello, everyone. Yeah, I think it's still morning, yeah, right? Yeah, still yeah, morning. still morning. Okay, yeah, we're a little late this morning. Uh, so how are you doing this week, dear? I'm doing okay. How are you? I'm doing okay. No big news, no events or anything from last week to report? Mm, no. No slideshows I, I had to hastily <laughs> right. create before create the show. Put in post-production. <laughs> no, quiet, quiet week. Okay, nothing wrong with that. Mm-hmm. So this week, uh, we got a lot of things to talk about on Disney Detective. We'll be talking about uh, Disney's theme parks going vegan uh, with their menu selections. Uh, Then we will talk about uh, Disney getting serious about saving Star Wars land. I I did not know it needed to be saved, but we'll we'll talk about that. Uh, As prices rise and attendance lags, uh, Walt Disney World axes some of its performers. We'll talk about that. Then we will talk about the Disney's... uh, U.S. Parks Chief leaving after 15 years with the company. All of this sounds like some interesting shakeups with uh, Disney Parks. Then in our entertainment news, Spider-Man has been saved. We'll talk about that and the deal that Disney and Sony have uh, uh, come to a compromise on. Uh, Then we'll talk about just how terrible the ratings were for the Emmys this year, uh, which marks a disturbing trend downward for the Emmys. And then we have some information following up on uh, Bruce Springsteen, a hometown favorite here in New Jersey. And then we'll finish up with our insightful picks of the week. Are we ready to get into it? Sure, let's do it. All righty. Go for Disney Detective. So this was a story that you actually found on CNN that on Tuesday, Disney had announced that plant-based food options will actually be added at every dining location in their U.S. parks. More than 400 vegan dishes will be available at quick service uh, places as as well as table service restaurants in Orlando uh, starting in early October. And then in Anaheim, uh, California's Disneyland, uh, in spring of 2020. Um, there's actually more than 200, uh, sorry, 600 and two places to eat at Walt Disney World in Orlando and Disneyland Resort in Anaheim. And most of them have some sort of unique uh, theme food, you know, that goes along with the, the hotel or right. the area that they're, that they're in. Um, Disney is being careful to call the items plant-based and not vegan, and that's because the exact definition of definition of what qualifies as vegan has long been a moving target. Um, So to help guests easily spot the plant-based meals, Disney is marking the menu item with a little green leaf logo. Uh, The company did say that of all the items, uh, that all the items um, are made without animal meat, dairy, eggs, or honey, meeting the broadest definition of what a vegan cuisine would be. So I thought that was kind of interesting. And what's, you know, they've always, Disney has always been kind of the the forefront of meals, um, you know, for people with allergies or or restrictions or anything. And for a lot of people, um, most people didn't even know that they offered, you know, meals 
that were so specific to right. you know certain things um and i guess as more and more people um have you know found that they had food allergies it's been more you know widely known and what we found interesting was um you know like if you go to to a, a quick serve uh restaurant they'll have their regular menu they don't necessarily show what is available in the different dietary needs but what we found one of the last times we were there when you used um the disney app and you do the mobile ordering that that's where you the see full you the full order. menu yeah. so like chicken nug you know chicken nuggets you know gluten free this or nut friendly this and you know well, that was like even when we we're staying in in california we mm-hmm. ate at the grand uh californian right um i had approached you know right. one of the staff there about um a a, a a dessert that right. would be friendly for diabetics. Right. And, you know, everything that they had out really wasn't appropriate for right. a diabetic. And, you know, they took the time to go in the back and actually come out with something that was right. healthy for me. Right. And I think it's always been something that's been available. You just had to, to ask. Right. But now, you know, it'll be something visual that you'll be able to see. You don't necessarily, you know, need to ask for it. And it's not just the normal, you know, vegan option of let me have some pasta, right. you know, or a salad. Right. You and know? I think I think this is uh, this is slightly different than the I have an allergy. What can mm-hmm. you do for me? Anything? This is more uh, Disney opening up their their menus to people with different dietary needs in general. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and just overall, you know, having a healthy... I mean, Disney's always tried to make their meals mm-hmm. healthy, but there's right. always so so much... So healthy you can make a cheeseburger and, you know, chicken nuggets and stuff. Right, right. So I think this, is, this marks a good trend in them moving more towards that healthy mm-hmm. eating um, type yeah, of menu. Yeah, definitely. So very good. Kudos to Disney for Kudos that. Kudos for them. So Disney is now trying to save Star Wars land. Um, not that it's, you know, been out long enough for it to, to really be a failure, I guess, in, in most eyes. But, you know, they obviously haven't been seeing attendance um, the way they expected it to be. Right. Um, so they're actually doing this big media blitz that's actually going to be kicking off on Tuesday uh, with promotional spots on basically all of ABC's, you know, different shows. So uh, Live with Kelly and Ryan is going to do uh, a little segment. Um, and then on Thursday, there's going to be um, some Galaxy's Edge stuff on Good Morning America, and then The View, and even Nightline. So they're doing, you know, early morning, late at night. And then even some of their primetime shows, like Modern Family and Dancing with the Stars, will have little plugs here and there about, you know, obviously Galaxy's Edge in in both locations, uh, Disneyland and obviously Disney World. Um, And then, of course, what we had talked about the other week, uh, last week about uh, Freeform having their two-hour special, right. so that kind of culminates, you know, with everything. And then they were even saying, you know, e- even ESPN is going to be, you know, getting in on it with some little uh, montages and, and talking about it, you know, on college game day, you know, commentaries and, and stuff. Um, so obviously the the push is to, you know get the word out that, hey, Galaxy's Edge is open if you didn't already know. Um, You know, because obviously they've been having issues because they had the problem when they, you know, had the price hikes and then you had the blocking um, of access for annual pass holders, Mm -hmm. you know, so they weren't able to go, um, you know, but obviously, uh, you know, I'm I'm thinking a lot of people might be waiting till Rise of the Resistance attraction opens because that's really supposed to be like the wow factor, you know, ride um, of the whole of the whole park. Uh, So it could be that, you know, some people are are waiting for that. Um, You know, Disneyland attendance has been down. Um, you know, one of the other stories that we'll get into, you know, kind of talks about the effects of not just obviously Galaxy's Edge is having, but the whole, you know, theme park in, in general is seeing. Um, and there was one 
tidbit uh, in the article that that actually said that among uh, guests of the park, the um, Millennium Falcon ride wasn't even listed as like one of the top ten rides of the park. It was kind of, you know, on the bottom of yeah, it was okay, right? You know, so obviously the well, and and this whole campaign sounds an awful lot like desperation on Disney's part. Yeah, and it and um, also it could have they, been the thing is they haven't addressed what is probably the real issue is they're pricing themselves out of the market, right? Right. You know, they've had, I think, what, three or four price hikes in ticket prices since Galaxy's Edge was announced during and all during construction. Probably, yeah. You shut half of the park down, but you're still charging full admission to mm-hmm. get into it. Right. You know, maybe this is just a sign that people are fed up with putting up with Disney's BS. Yeah, it definitely. You know, you know, and they're making be. no attempts whatsoever to lower prices, mm-hmm. even right. though they're raking in more money than God. Right. So, you know, this is Disney reaping what they sow. Mm-hmm. They spent all this money on what they thought was going to be huge. And they, the worst part is they were banking on this taking off like a rocket just because it's Star Wars. Right. And you know what? If they haven't learned by now just from the movies, Star Wars fans are a finicky bunch. Mm-hmm. And they have very high standards. So yeah. if you don't cater to those standards, do not expect the kind of returns that you're going to get from everything else that Disney, you know, they're not zombies. Right. You know? And I don't mean to insult Disney fans, but Disney right. fans, who, people who are just Disney fanatics, will do Disney things no matter what. Star Wars fans, they're very critical. Mm-hmm. And I think this also goes back to what we've talked about, too, is that while you know we haven't seen it firsthand, you know we haven't gone and, and experienced it yet, while it looks beautiful and, and everything... Is it something where if they would have stuck with a storyline of the original trilogy characters, and that is another huge that factor probably there. would I'll play be, into I'll it. I'll be perfectly honest with you. You know I'm a huge Star Wars fan. Really? I really have very little interest in going there because right. it's not my Star Wars. Right. It's Disney's Star Wars. Right. And since Disney has taken over the franchise, they've bastardized the franchise. Mm-hmm. So... You know, I want to go at some point in time just for the sake of going. But right, Disney, you know, when you eliminate what made Star Wars great, you know, the original trilogy, the original characters, the original stories, mm-hmm. how do you not have Darth Vader walking around? Right. Like that, to me, that's Darth Vader. That's mm-hmm. Star Wars. Right. And, and you're robbing, you know, diehard fans like me of mm-hmm. that. So you're not going to get my money. It's just right. that simple. Right. So, yeah. next on our Disney bashing, I mean, uh, Disney <laughs> news list. So, as prices rise, obviously, and attendance lags, Walt Disney has been uh, axing some of the Orlando performers. Um, so, in what's become kind of an annual tradition uh, ahead of the end of the fiscal year at Walt Disney World, the resort has recently seen a wave of layoffs and cutbacks. Um, as usual, the reductions have been met by outrage by Disney fans who have obviously been turning on law, uh, going to online petitions and similar campaigns to show their disapproval. Um, this isn't the first time that it's happened. Um, this year, the cuts are hitting the live action department. Uh, Animal Kingdom has seen um, a band that plays in Africa being cut. Uh, the Muppet Show that they started not that long ago in Magic Kingdom in Liberty Square has been cut. Then Magic Kingdom's Royal Majestic Makers and the Coco Puppet Show uh, in Epcot are completely cut. Um, even some of the shows that were playing seven days a week are now actually down to just five days a week. Um, and again, this isn't the first time, you know, that it's it's happened. They're, you know, very popular group off kilter that was in Epcot uh, got the axe not that long ago, um, you know, and it, it's and some of these acts, you know, have only been around, you know, for a little while where others have been around for decades. Um, and I actually had a friend who was part of um, one of the bands. Uh, he was he was a musician. Um, he didn't play every day. He was kind of a, a backup person for one of the groups. Right. And not that long ago, uh, I guess maybe it's been a couple of years now, you know, he was one of the ones that, that got axed. And a lot of it was that they, you know, kind of shifted from hiring uh, equity actors and 
basically outsourcing, you know, non-union people to to play. So that was, you know, a big push that they they did you you know you saw it too with um some of the street actors that you would see you know walking around you know the street atmosphere uh yeah. actors you know in and, a you lot know, of that's cases a, it's a shame because it adds character to your park mm-hmm. experience yeah um it serves as crowd control mm-hmm. to cut down lines because yep. you know you can get a decent sized crowd of people sitting watching a live show on the on the street there and right. you know it opens up an opportunity to get on a mm-hmm. ride right right um but it detracts overall from mm-hmm. the experience and that's what always made disney kind of different from everything else because you would go to you know a six flags or you'd go to a dorney park or something and they wouldn't have that you know because you were basically going to go on rides whereas when you go to disney you go for the experience exactly you know and we've had it happen multiple times you know one of the last times we were at hollywood studios that you know they were pretending to to film some sort of movie scene right, and, and right. had you know you and maddie you know do something and and you know do some silly yeah, and quirky it makes things you feel and, like the right. park itself is alive at that point. right exactly and i find it hard to believe when you can pay this man $156 million <laughs> your, a your year. Your favorite guy in the whole wide world. <laughs> you pay the man $156 million a year to make excuses why the parks aren't successful. Mm-hmm. And you can't afford to pay the performers that make the park special. Right, right. That's a problem. That's mm-hmm. a real problem. And, and Disney's really getting lost in itself when they get to the point where they're going to cut the quality entertainment that people go to the parks for right. to pay executives who don't do their job. Right, right. So. And and again, a lot of it has to do, you know, with, with the ticket prices that we've, you know, constantly uh, been talking about. You know, the other thing, too, is that um, there were actually certain... Um, the the photographers that take your photo pass pictures, a bunch of them have actually been replaced by AI photo takers that they have now where you basically go and stand in a spot and it'll take your photo. So there's not even, you know, a person around. Um, So what I thought was interesting was at the end of uh, this article, it talked about, you know, the ticket prices. So, you know, ticket prices, you know, in the last decade, you know, went from $79 for one day to $159 on (laughs) the most popular days, which we even (laughs) have experienced because we're planning to, to be down in the area around the holidays and we're not even going to the parks right, because it's not economical. It would be, you know, over $450 for one day for just the three of us to go. So in this article, it said that if ticket prices were tied to inflation, the $79 ticket price in 2009 would actually only be $94 today. Right. So it shows you that it's not just, inflation it's you know what we've always said they're they're just really greedy when it comes to it and you're obviously okay so what am i getting for that 159 dollars? that's always what i go back mm-hmm. to is that you're you continue to increase the prices right. but you continue to cut the services mm-hmm. whether it's cutting performers in the park and killing the experience whether it's putting uh, digital chips on your uh soft drink cups so that you can right. only get so many refills right or charging me for parking in a lot that you never charged for parking before. Mm-hmm. It's like, it's ridiculous. Like right. You continue to charge more, but provide less and less service for what you're charging. And it's to the point now that I really have absolutely no compunction whatsoever to give Disney more of my money. Mm-hmm. So. So when are we getting Disney Plus? <sighs> You know what? I don't think I know. I don't want to pay for Disney. If you want to get it, you're more than welcome to get it. <laughs> I can use my Disney dollars. Then technically, I'm I'm not paying for it. You Disney keep is. telling yourself that. <laughs> <laughs> and our last bash Disney article. Uh, for today. So Disney's U.S. park chief leaves after 15 years with the company. Catherine Powell, who ran the U.S. and Paris theme parks for Walt Disney during the opening of two Star Wars lands, is leaving the company. Why is that, Mm. I wonder? I don't know. It said that the 15-year 
uh, veteran is departing to do something different, Disney said on Monday, and obviously she couldn't be reached for comments. Uh, Powell was credited for revigorating the company's two parks with new attractions, and she also worked in Disney's uh, TV division earlier in her career. Her position has actually been eliminated, and the heads of the individual resorts will now report directly to the chairman of Disney's Parks Experience and Production Division. So it wasn't like they replaced her, they just, you know, got rid of the position. Right. Or is it convenient that they're just getting rid of it well, for now? Well, you know, <clears throat> you can't get rid of the person and, like... And replace, replace and not them right, and, right, yeah. So basically, Disney, the world's largest theme park operator, unveiled obviously two of the expanses uh, this year, but obviously have been, you know, the attendance has has fallen during you know the three months, um, you know, and this is probably some of the the backlash. So on know, that note, it. I think it's important to uh, point out once again that. Disney's paying this man $156 million a year, and they're justifying it by saying the success of the company is based entirely on his input. Now, we've talked about several downfalls the company's had, including park attendance, which somehow he took credit for the park attendance only a few months ago. Right. But somehow now the park attendance is down, it's not his fault. Right. It's somebody else's fault. We got right. rid of that person whose fault that was. Right. Bob Iger needs to go. <laughs> Bob Iger needs to own up to his mistakes, realize he's out of his league, and he needs to go. $156 million, and they're ruining the company and the park experience for the, for the guests because they're paying this man $156 million a year. Okay. I'm down off my soapbox now. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> Got to use that, reuse that picture a couple times. You, uh, that was fantastic. I'm so, I'm I so like glad <laughs> you like. See, look at that. How concert, you know, um, you're such a conservationist, yep. and you know, that's what I go for. You're total. That's so imagine what I could do with 156 million dollars. Wow. Yeah. That's, yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Is that like the catchphrase? 156 million dollars. What would I do? And I look more like Han Solo than Han Solo. And, so. That. Uh, I think that's all we have for Disney Detective. <laughs> yes, that is. Let's move on to entertainment news. Sure. So Spider-Man will stay in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Tell us about this good news. So after briefly having a breakup, Sony Pictures and Marvel have found a way to get back together and have Spider-Man, you know, Save the day. So on Friday, the two companies uh, jointly announced that Marvel Studios will produce the third film in the Spider-Man Homecoming series, and it will feature again Tom Holland reprising his role. Uh, The rumor mill roared back to life this week when hints of the two companies were close to brokering an agreement. And obviously over the summer, the news came out that Marvel and Disney... um, had you know issues with sony they couldn't come to an agreement um on the financials uh, of everything and you know sony said well that's it you're never using him you know he's he's back to you know being just a sony uh entity um so the new deal was actually signed late thursday night uh negotiations obviously involved the top players of both studios and in exchange for um lending you know, um, Spider-Man, uh, Marvel and Disney will roughly receive about 25% of the profits. Uh, Disney will retain its merchandising rights and will pull up, uh, roughly a quarter of the finances. Um, as the arrangement, as part of the arrangement, Spider-Man will also appear in one future Marvel Studios film. Uh, the film is actually scheduled to be released July 16th of 2021. So everybody seems very excited that Spider-Man has been allowed to return to the the MCU because it was like all over the place. So so let me paint so. <laughs> let me paint my interpretation here, and I promise I won't go back to a Bob Iger picture. Sure. Yeah, it's already off the screen. Okay. Just so sure. so Disney realizing that they were potentially going to lose millions and millions of dollars mm-hmm. by being obstinate idiots finally decided to cave in like 
you know, a cheap lawn chair <laughs> and take what scraps Sony was going to give them because it was going to be so much money. That's my take on it. I guess they figured, you know, because originally they wanted 50-50. Right. And I guess they figured, well, 25 is better than exactly. nothing. Let's so. not pretend that Disney did this for the sake of the fans or the franchise or the storyline or any kind of, you know, integrity-based reason. They did this strictly out of greed. Well, of course. They can't walk away from that kind of money. Well, because they're losing so much money with Galaxy's Edge, right? Exactly. <laughs> Where's that picture of Where's that picture? Stop. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Bad. So what is next on the sleep? Uh, so uh, the Emmys were this past Sunday, and I don't think anybody really cared. <laughs> where, where are they? I, okay. I'll take your word for um, it. You know, we had actually talked, uh, you know, briefly about them when uh, the nominations had, had come out, and it was just such an extensive list because it was, you know, for this category and this category and this category, like you couldn't just say, here are the top, you know, 10 categories because they're like... It seemed like over a hundred different categories. Um, so for the so it's like kindergarten now. Everyone gets a participation it, it award. It definitely kind of seems that way. So for the second year in a row, the Emmy Awards have hit an all-time low in the ratings. Um, and you know th they were saying that a lot of it had to do with um, you know not having a host again. This was you know another year that they basically decided to have, you know, they still had presenters come out and they kind of had, um, you know, uh, one person kind of doing like the, the voiceovers, um, you know, every now and then, but overall it was just a very, you know, like nobody was running the show. It was just very chaotic and whatever. Um, I actually only watched it for maybe 15, 20 minutes, you know, if that, um, cause it just wasn't, you know, keeping my attention. Plus again, there were just so many different, you know, categories, you know, out there where, um, you know, it, like you said, it, it almost seemed like the kindergarten, you know, everybody gets a, participation award now granted there were some you know definite highlights of the show there were there were some speeches that were very moving um you know the uh, of of things that were were brought up and obviously some you know uh monumentous things with um you know upsets of you know people that have been nominated for so long and and you know they finally won something and obviously game of thrones won a whole bunch and this was their last year that they were you know nominated but overall you know in in the ratings you know sunday night football did did a whole lot better um you know than the emmys and and people you know other entertainment uh groups were were kind of saying well you know maybe this is kind of you know, the downfall of, you know, so many different award show out there. You have, you know, it used to be you had, you know, your Academy Awards, you had, um, you know, your Emmys, which, you know, it, it was from like 8 o'clock to, you know, 11 p.m. And I'm sure it even went over. Plus, they also do the creative Emmys, which they don't even broadcast. But, you know, they talk about that as well. So it's kind of, you know... So let me ask you this. What do you think they would have to do for an Emmy show to keep your interest? Shorter. Okay. Um, and probably consolidate, you know, the the awards down. You know, not so many different categories. You know, like they, they do categories not only for, you know, your favorite TV show, but then, you know, if it's a, a comedy or a drama, that's two different categories. Um, reality show, you know, I don't even think you need to have reality show. Talk show, you know, it, it just, you know, basically every genre you, is out there. Do you think the lack of a host would, I think you know, that if they had a kind host, of, it would pique your interest? You know, and that kind of does it. And I'm not saying get rid of some of those categories but maybe don't televise it let's let's do you know the top actor in a comedy top actor right. in a drama top drama top comedy 
And, you know, and like... just get rid of reality TV and Get rid of reality TV or, you know, costuming and, and, you know, things like that. You know, do, you know, do the top ones. And again, you could still have awards for all these people because, you know, obviously there are people... Um, there, there's a friend of mine who his husband um, did uh, special effects on The Walking Dead and he won one of the creative Emmys you know, years ago when, when he was working, um, on the walking dead. And again, it was during the creative Emmys that, you know, that weren't, um, being broadcasted at all. Um, but he's in the industry and, you know, this is a chance for people in the industry, not the, the top celebrities, but you know, the, the guy going into work, you know, every day, their chance to be recognized. Well, and of course, they're the ones that don't get the the televised right, version of the right because nobody's going to know who any of them are like who's that but like i could see you know if you still want to recognize people in the industry you know the sound director and the lighting and this sure, you know yeah. blah, 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 blah. fine still and give they them definitely out deserve to, to be recognized right such and, a key and part. right and just like you know the, i know that um you know uh, the one of the local radio stations that i listened to they had some sort of um you know award ceremony you know a couple of months ago and they talked about oh yeah we we won the award for you know best daytime you know talk radio show da, 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 da. and you know so within every industry there's always some sort of an award or recognition thing but do you have to you know go on for hours and hours right. and subject everybody else to to watch it or you could do you know the Emmys in in an hour and a half with the top awards, and then you know so expedite it, keep it organized, mm -hmm. keep it moving. Yeah, you know, yeah. makes sense. But I definitely agree that the people behind the scenes, you know, like the guys that run the boards and produce it and write it, and you know, the guys that do all the technical stuff and the they editing, need to get appreciation. Um, they definitely need to be appreciated. You appreciate them more now, don't you? Even even the people that do this sort of thing on a podcast, not mentioning any names <laughs> or anything, they deserve the appreciation <laughs> as well because it's a lot of work. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, okay, so the Emmy sucked. What's next? So, in a nice little. Here's how we end the uh, the feel good story. This was a, a nice little article that I saw on CNN um, about Bruce Springsteen. Um, he's never had a number one hit, but he's probably one of the most honored American rock stars ever. Which is new was news to me when I heard right. he never and had when a number I, one. And when I saw the article too, uh, so the reason for the article was because the boss turned seventy. Uh, during the week. So they did a nice little uh, montage article. Um, so yes, he's never had a number one hit on the pop charts. His biggest hit, which was Dancing in the Dark, peaked at number two in 1984. So close, but no cigar. Very, very close. Um, so he obviously hasn't sold as many records as probably Billy Joel um, and not as influential as Elvis or Chuck Berry, but he's most certainly one of the most honored rock stars of all time. Uh, over his five year, uh, five decade career, um, Springsteen has won tw 20 Grammys, an Oscar, two Golden Globes, a Special Tony Award, and a Kennedy Center Honor, plus obviously numerous um, American Music Awards and MTV Video Music Awards. Uh, he was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 1999, and in 2016, President Obama awarded him with the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the highest uh, the nation's highest civilian honor. Um, and he's still, you know, a musical force to be, you know, reckoned with. Um, you know, he, he writes great songs. There's poetry to them. Um, but you know, his, his shows have also been legendary. Um, you know, at 66 years old, he played for four hours and four minutes in a, a concert in Philadelphia in 2016. Um, you know, he's not afraid to challenge his audience. You know, he, he has the traditional, you know, aspects uh, you know, of a rocker, but then he kind of pulls out, you know, the acoustic mm -hmm. aspect of him, kind of a little bit country, but then has that, you know, rock, you know, uh, uh, undertone. Um, you know, one of the best halftime Super Bowl shows, um, you know, w was done in 2000. Um, 
uh, 2009, um, where, you know, he basically started out, you know, step away from the guacamole dip, you know, I want to, and put down the chicken finger and, and turn, uh, and turn your television all the way up, you know, and rocked it. And, you know, and I think people who, you know, weren't fans, you know, before that, you know, definitely be, became a fan. Um, and he's revered by, you know, other musicians from, you know, Rage Against the Machine and, you know, having covers, um, the Pointer Sisters and, you know, Ed Sheeran and Vampire Weekend. And, you know, basically he's, he's worked, you know, or been on stage with Chuck Berry, Roy Orbison, you know, um, Paul McCartney, Mick Jagger, Billy Joel, you you know, Eddie Vedder, you know, just they all, you know, come together, sure, you know, yeah. um, and he's obviously been, you know, opened about things in his past um, in a memoir in 2016 called Born to Run. He was very candid about his battle with depression. He said he, you know, had two emotional breakdowns. One was when he was 32 and another was when he was in his 60s. Um, and obviously he's been a voice for social change, you know, whatever you think of his politics, you know, obviously he's you know, back Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton and other Democrats. He's obviously very compassionate, you know, uh, about, you know, the do downtrodden and does, you know, um, different, you know, concerts for different charities, you know, for Vietnam vets, for the homeless, you know, environmental, you know, uh, causes. He's also been an outspoken ag ag um, advocate for the LGBTQ rights. Um, and that in 2016, he was actually one of the first artists to boycott North Carolina's anti um, transgendered bathroom bill. So all around, you know, Great guy, no number one hit, but I think in you know so many people's minds, you know one of the one of the best you know rockers being, out there. So being from New Jersey, we tend to get a little bit more exposure to Bruce than the rest of the country. Does. Oh, absolutely. Um, so we see a lot of the things that don't make the the national mm -hmm. mainstream news. Right, that make like our local news. He has news. a tendency of on a v almost regular basis showing up at the Stone Pony. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah. And getting up on stage and right. supporting the local a uh, acts and, mm -hmm. and musicians that mm -hmm. are there. Yeah. Um, he's always been big on supporting the community. He still lives in the community. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. he didn't move to some. Right. He didn't move someplace else. Sheltered area. Right. He, he like, stayed he in still, Jersey. Yeah, he stayed in Jersey. He's, mm -hmm. He still comes out and, you know, he walks the streets mm -hmm. of... Uh, um, Asbury Park. Asbury Park, thank you. Um, you know that place. And, you know, he's got he's got very tight connections mm -hmm. to the community here. And that was, you know, the story that we talked about a couple weeks ago with the movie that came out right. that was, you know, based in, you know, England, you know, and, and the kids listening to all of, you know, his music from Born in the USA, and they had the premiere, you know, in... Asbury Park, and he showed up. It yeah. wasn't a planned thing, you know. Well, what I've always liked about Springsteen was he came from basically nothing, a working class family. Mm -hmm. So what he wrote about is what he lived. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. You know, you have, you have incredibly talented musicians like Billy Joel, who literally could write about anything mm -hmm. just because of make how a great creative song. they are. Yeah, yeah. Where... You know, the songs that Springsteen writes mm -hmm. are, are life experiences, mm -hmm. and you can feel it in the passion in, in the way that the song is written. Yeah, yeah. And the way that it's performed. Um, he served as an inspiration to countless musicians, like mm -hmm. you said. Yeah, yeah. And um, he does it by example. It does, mm -hmm. he, he's not the type of person, he's very humble. Mm -hmm. And he's not the type of person who says, you know, do as I do because I am Bruce Springsteen. He doesn't necessarily want to be a role model. Mm -hmm. He just is by example, right? Um, and I think that's the, tr the the best kind of role model you could have. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah. Kudos to Bruce. So happy birthday, Bruce. Uh, seventy. Wow, I really feel old now. <laughs> Jeez. Anyway, I think that's it for our entertainment news. Yep. We'll be back with our insightful picks of the week. Mm -hmm. Good.
Go for your pick, my dear. So my pick is a new show that just started last week. Uh, we both sat down and, and watched it, which doesn't always <laughs> Well, no, because most of the stuff we usually binge watch. Now I have to wait every week to watch I know. This is this actually is on, like, regular television. Uh, so the show is Prodigal Son. It is an American drama series on Fox. Uh, the series centers around Malcolm Bright, whose father, Martin Whitley, is the infamous serial killer known as the Surgeon. Malcolm was one could of... could have been worse. They could have named him the Doctor. <laughs> that, then that would have been a whole other thing. Um, so Malcolm was actually the one responsible as a child for enabling the police uh, to arrest his father. Um, and he, you know, and since that time hadn't seen him you know in 10 years um now the son who is a profiler and a former fbi agent uh, is currently working with the new york city police department and malcolm is actually forced now to confront his father after a copycat killer uses his methods of killing and now he the son finds himself kind of drawn back into that constant contact with his father who he must use his insight to help solve uh to use um, the insights to help the police solve the crimes um, and also battle his inner demons. Um, we've only seen, you know, only had a chance to see one episode so far because it just debuted um, this past week. And it seems like a, a nice little thriller. Um, kind of reminded me of um, when we used to watch Lie to Me. Yes. Where it's, you know, they kind of show you how the, you know, the main uh, character is thinking, kind of mm -hmm. like what they're seeing. Um, also, the mentalist with other yep. little cues of, you know, facial expressions and eye movement and, you know, um, you know, very Sherlock Holmes-ish in a way of, okay, the body is laying this way, you know, so that's because something came here and the broken glass is laid out this way because, you know, she dropped it as opposed to throwing it and, and things like that. Right. Um, so I thought it was very well done in, in that respect. Um, the characters, you know, the, the mother um, is very over the top. Yeah. Uh, crazy. Uh, the sister, they haven't really shown a whole lot, you know, with her yet. Um, and then there's the uh, the dynamic of the father and the son, obviously. And then um, the police detective, who's kind of a mentor uh, to the, the son as well. So there's that dynamic uh, as well. So it'll be interesting to see, you know, how it how it plays out beyond this this first uh, episode that they had. Yeah, I was very impressed with the first episode. It it certainly kept my interest and mm -hmm. made me come back to watch mm -hmm. the next episode, which was on last night, so we can watch it tonight now. So. Oh, okay. Um, but yeah, I think it's a good pick. Mm -hmm. Good pick, good show, and we'll see where it goes. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. So my pick this week is a documentary series on Netflix called The Mind Explained. Uh, ever wonder what's happened, happening inside your head? From dreaming to anxiety disorders, discover how your brain works with this illuminating series. Uh, and they go on and they it's a five-part series. Okay. And they break it down into key elements from memory to dreams to anxiety to mindfulness to psychedelics is the last episode. Ooh, get your mushrooms. Um, and that's <laughs> largely what they talk about. Okay. You know, magic mushrooms, the psychedelic effect. Oh, okay. What's interesting is they actually go in through a mix of animation and MRIs and medical imaging and actually show you how the brain activates, what regions of the brain activate, oh, okay. the brain mappings, mm -hmm. um, how your memory works. They look at real life um, scenarios where they, in the memory incident, for instance, they had one incident where they had uh, one of their guest stars had an accident and okay. had to have part of his brain removed. I don't know if it was from damage or... Um, I think it may have just been a tumor that he had in there, and then he had that brain surgery. Okay. Well, in in having that brain surgery, it affected a region in the brain that handled short term memory. Okay. So, the man 
you know, you've seen movies, you know, Fifty First Dates was one good movie where you okay. have people with short memory right. issues. Mm-hmm. And he didn't remember anything from the previous two hours. Oh, wow. Uh, beyond the past two hours. So he would ha- literally have to, his whole life is taking a notebook with him. Okay. And writing, writing everything down, down. Wakes up the next morning and basically needs to be briefed. Oh, wow. About, okay. But he could remember stuff from... 30 years ago. Okay. So, so it's the short-term memory that's right. gone. And what's interesting is they show you the areas of the brain that activate when these things happen. Um, they look at dreams. And uh, they took rats, for instance. Okay. And they ran rats through a maze. Mm-hmm. And then they sedated the rats so they fell asleep. And then they watched the rats dreaming going okay. through the maze, the same parts of the brain. Okay. Okay. Activated, so they knew the rat was dreaming about running through the maze to get the cheese. <laughs> um, very interesting show. Okay, it, it was one of the more unique takes on the human mind and and getting a, a very deep understanding of how the human mind works. Uh, when they get to the last episode with psychedelics, um, they talk about the experiences, you know, and, and of course this the experimentation in these. Uh, psychotic uh, psychedelic drugs started in the 50s and 60s and they talk about the people that use these having this enlightening this this epiphany okay and they go back and they look at some of the studies of of what parts of the brain were activated and how it was areas of the brain that the brain the human body doesn't normally use and by unlocking these okay. areas of the brain, it actually helped them after the use of the drugs to gain more use of their brain, hmm. which was very interesting to actually see, which also makes me wonder, you know, why the federal government has outlawed the, <laughs> those right? drugs at this point in time. <laughs> um, but very good, very informative. Huh. Um, the Mind Explained on Netflix, five-part series streaming now. Okay. Uh, That was it for my pick. We'll come back with a few afterthoughts. Yep. So enlighten us with some afterthoughts. So these were actually ones that we had uh, talked about uh, the other week with the different toy shows and and things that were coming up. So these are ones that are actually going to be happening within uh, the next couple of weeks. And I just wanted to, you know, remind uh, anybody or or mention it again, if anybody that was in the area would be interested in going. Um, So next weekend on October 5th is the Delaware train show. And then on October 6th is the Oktoberfest toy show. And both are at the new shrine center in Newcastle, Delaware. Nurshrine. Nurshrine, sorry. Um, you can uh, do a search for toyshows.org, uh, and I believe that is their website, or just do a, a Google search for Delaware Train Show or Oktoberfest Toy Show uh, to get the exact uh, directions. Um, and then on October 20th is the Jersey Shore Toy Show that is in Manasquan, New Jersey, so up towards uh, Central Jersey. Uh, the Delaware, for us, it's about a half hour, so probably about, what, 20 minutes outside of Philadelphia? Yeah. Um, so, you know, not too bad of a, a ride uh, overall. So if you're, you know, in our listening area um, and interested in going to a toy show, I know the Oktoberfest, I think it's like a $5 admission uh, to yeah, get it's in. Yeah, reasonable. Again. Yeah, um, it's from 10 to, to 4. Under 12 or free? I think so. Um, and then the Jersey Shore, I'm not sure, but I think it was a nominal fee uh, as well. So, again, if you're interested, those are the, the upcoming shows that are available. Cool. And I think that was it for us. Mm-hmm. Uh, don't forget to check us out on our website at www.insightsintothings.com, Facebook at uh, facebook.com backslash insights into things podcast or you can hit us on twitter at insights under things uh, insights underscore things sorry insights <laughs> underscore things yes and obviously you can email us at comments at insights into things dot com and I think that's it I think we're done I think we're done another one in the books yep take care everyone have a good week everyone <laughs>